essentially I'm going to try and interrogate two interrelated questions. Question one, and, uh, and sometimes can, people can get kind of over-pessimistic, but you can tell a really very concerned narrative about the decline and fall of the West that we're living through. The period that um, we're all familiar with, I'm a, I'm a baby boomer, the kind of ordered, mixed economy, kind of internationally kind of framed world I've grown up in and which we've all prospered from kind of broadly 1945 to 2009, 10, uh, was abnormal. And what's normal is the period between 1870 and 1945 much more turbulent, uh, where there wasn't an international hegemon to keep order, there was no international framework of any type, and we had an extremely stressed universe. And that interrelated with, and that interconnected with, an extraordinary change in the technological base between 1870 and uh, 1945. Very similar, I think, to the um, challenges that digitization, you were discussing artificial intelligence at your tables, is going to um, provide over the decades ahead. And that um, an unmediated capitalism uh, threw up incredible kind of tensions, inequalities, reactions. Uh, and we all know, you know what happened in that period. And that the period ahead um, could look like that unless we're very, very careful. Uh, one of my um, criticisms of people like Michael Gove and Boris Johnson uh, who are intelligent men, is that they assume that Britain leaving the European Union will mean that the international order remains just as it is, off which we can piggyback without making any contribution to that order. I think there's a really serious risk of a domino effect um, of our departure from the European Union, both in the breakup of the United Kingdom um, and in the breakup of um, the European Union. And I know the royal family thinks that, notwithstanding the Sun's headline. These are very serious waters into which we're steering, um, not only as a national community here in Britain, but actually as citizens of the West and as global citizens. And, and uh, I noticed just on the table I sat on, you know, you are all concerned, and uh, just the briefing from your discussions yesterday, about you know, where does the law add value um, in this kind of new landscape that's emerging. I think you'll recognize the trends I'm describing. Um, what we all have to kind of figure out is how intense they are, what the countervailing forces will be. Um, and there are countervailing, and there are countervailing forces. And um, moments of like this are also moments of opportunity as well as moments of challenge. I know that's banal, and that's what they always say at leadership conferences, but it's true. Um, off we go. So that's the title. And um, by the way, I'm principal of Hartford College in Oxford. So, I mean, I literally, I'm just summing up here um, what I've just told you. Um, Donald Trump wrote an article in the Washington Post yesterday in which he argued for swinging tariffs on Chinese exports to the United States, the renegotiation of all America's um, trade relationships, the suspension of the uh, creation of this trans-Pacific trade area, an American politician hasn't talked in those terms since we had the disastrous um, Smoot-Hawley tariffs in 1929 that precipitated the World Depression of the 1930s. He is exploiting the anti-immigration sentiment in the States um, and the sense by you know, a, lot of, a, lot, a, a lot of white working class Americans that actually the, the, the system as structured doesn't work for them. A Trump victory would without doubt um, be a kind of uh, nail in the coffin of the World Trade Organization. Uh, certainly, would be, I mean, the, the, the failing UN would fall apart. Um, I think uh, you know, the system of international economic governance with the IMF would be extremely, uh, would be extremely stressed. And I, you know, there is little question that um, it would be a huge setback, global setback. I have to understand why that's happening. Why could it be that someone like this uh, it has got as far as he's got? In parallel, there are, everyone recognizes similar sentiments in Europe. They're, a bit, they're more subtle uh, and sometimes not so subtle. Look at what's going on in um, Hungary, for example, or Poland. Uh, and they come from the uh, kind of same roots, really, a distrust of the foreigner, distrust of the other, hostility to immigration, um, and anxiety to stress the virtues of Poland or Hungary, to say that you know, um, 
the blood of a Pole or the blood of a uh, Hungarian sets you apart from humanity and makes you very special, rather as Donald Trump would argue, the blood of an American does the same. This kind of talk of blood and ethnicity as, as uh, differentiating you from other countries and other peoples is extremely menacing and dangerous. We know where that's led in human history, and well, you, know, you don't need to kind of um, foretell the future when we can read the book ourselves. And there are echoes of that in the United Kingdom. Some of the, uh, you know, the, the call by Gove and Boris Johnson for sovereignty, uh, coupled with the uh, Nigel Farage's kind of extreme hostility to kind of immigration and the other, is very, you know, has echoes of what's going on in other parts of the world. And then, of course, there's what's going on in the Middle East. You know, you, everyone knows, saw the results in Germany. Uh, the interesting thing in Germany, I think, was kind of, yes, it was true that Alternative for Deutschland made big gains in some of the uh, states, the three states, there were elections on Sunday. But actually, um, the order held in Germany. The prime ministers of each of those three states actually remained prime ministers, and the pro kind of welcome Kultur parties, uh, Christian Democrats and the CDU, still just about hold power. But you can see, again, which way the trend is going. I'm a disciple, if you like, of on the right of people like Michael Heseltine and Peter Walker and Harold Macmillan, and on the left, and people like um, David Miliband, um, Tony Blair, even um, Alan Johnson. You know, that, that kind of view of how you kind of manage capitalism on, on left and right seems to me to be kind of a level-headed approach and also one which has provenly worked. Trouble is, in 2016, uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the extremists in both parties who actually are, are kind of um, putting the mainstream people on the defensive. Cameron is a mainstream liberal conservative. He's on the defensive against his right, um, and Corbyn runs the Labour Party. Who speaks for the mixed economy? And who speaks for the international treaty uh, system, um, which actually holds us together? Again, Cameron attempts to, um, as every former British living prime minister does, but that, that's not where the popular right-wing press is. And actually, you've got a situation in Britain where the popular right-wing press uh, and a faction in the Conservative Party are taking on the rest of the country. The leader of the TUC, Francis Grady, is speaking at a big lecture at my college on Friday, making the trade union case for staying in the European Union. Carolyn Fairburn, a friend of mine who runs the CBI, makes the same case for the CBI. The Union Employees Federation, same place. The government did its survey of 32 kind of um, parts of the economy to see what the balance sheet was, of pluses and minuses of staying in the European Union, led by William Hague, at the time a skeptic. Actually, William Hague has become the most Eurosceptic pro-European because the Foreign Office and the Treasury couldn't find one sector where there was a negative. So whether you're in farming or the Country Landowners Association, running manufacturing, Magic Circle Law Firm, um, do what you do, um, the benefits of being in surpass the benefits of being out. But actually, in a world in which the narrative is about the importance of sovereignty, distrust of the other, distrust of the foreigner, and where the operation of capitalism is throwing up so many losers, it's very, very hard to make that case. I also note in passing, and if you, can, if you want to question on me, uh, we'll certainly do this. Um, I wrote a book called uh, The Writing on the Wall about China, in which I foretold that um, in the second half of the 2010s, the Chinese system would fail. I think that's now very clear. I, I think the economic model in China is completely unsustainable. The party is not legitimate. Outspoken criticism on the floor of the parliament never happened um, since 1949 of the leadership. This view that China is, a, uh, is an engine of growth um, and never endingly going to go without any setback is, for my money, one of the mistaken fallacies of our times. What is unsustainable isn't sustained. And this interacts with, you know, what's happening in Syria. It interacts with Donald Trump. It interacts with Putin. It interacts with Ukraine. It interacts with Brexit. There's not a moment to kind of shatter the, the kind of European system, which is what Brexit would imply. Um, so um, this is, I mean, the, again, the guts of my story, really, is um, capitalism is the best system, but it's got incredible defects. It's very unstable. It has a propensity to live a fantastic inequality. And actually, uh, unless managed and shaped, it's very poor at generating good jobs and living conditions. You only have to revisit the period of 1870 and 1945 to have 
see how an unmediated, unregulated capitalism interacted with um, great general purpose technologies that came streaming through in that period. Uh, the aeroplane, the internal combustion engine, mass production, telecommunications, chemicals, electricity, great new materials like plastics, drugs. These things were transforming kind of the economic base and, and, and jobs and prospects, but actually creating mass unemployment at the same time. And, uh, and without the international framework, we saw the rise of fascism, the rise of communism, two world wars. Uh, it wasn't a happy time. And I think that, one of the, one of the, I mean, are, are we condemned um, to learn that actually what is taken as the kind of um, reflex kind of position of kind of leader writers on the Daily Mail and Daily Telegraph and, and a large part of the economics profession and many people in the city that actually all regulation is bad, free markets are always perfect, um, uh, that actually one should withdraw the state at every, at every opportunity, that um, social settlements are expensive and burdensome, um, dismiss the disadvantage of losers and shirkers. I mean, that was the kind of discourse um, of the elites uh, in that period. And, you know, we, we saw the reaction. You get a fantastic backlash. And I look at the kind of commentators of left and right who think that Donald Trump is a monster of the right's own creation. I think I've got it completely right. And actually pulling back the state has only been plausible because we've had this huge rise in private debt um, to compensate the inequality. And Martin Sorrell making 60 million pounds. I know Martin. And I, he's a very good executive, but is he really worth 60 million pounds a year? Running WPP, uh, you know, and that becomes a new benchmark for what, for, for what salaries should be. And meanwhile, um, the international framework in which all this is happening has been undermined. So you can get actually quite gloomy. But we're not going to be gloomy. A general purpose technology, and as, um, my favorite one of this list is um, the three masted sailing ship, which was invented by shipwrights in. in Kind of Spain at the end of the 15th century. And it was just a hull strong enough to hold the third mast, which allowed a ship to sail close to the wind. So close to the wind, you can cross the Atlantic and get back. And you can bring, and you can open up Latin America, you can bring all the bullion back, you can create the great European inflation, um, you can create maritime Europe, you can lead to the inflations that actually led to the Reformation and the collapse of the Catholic Church and rise of Protestantism, all because kind of a hundred shipwrights uh, in a at a dry dock um, in Cadiz, managed to push technology to the absolute limits in kind of the 1470s and create a three-masted sailing ship. Um, and so it's been through time. I mean, all these remarkable inventions have actually transformed the world. And you'll notice that there have been more of them in every century. And in, the tw in, the, in our century, the, two th the 2000s, um, the, techno the, the, the innovation theorists expect there to be not nine GPTs, but actually close to 20. The pace of their introduction is accelerating. There's not time to, to kind of mine that slide. But here are some of the areas in which uh, um, the, there are you know, transformative technologies, many of them underpinned, actually, by the meta-technology of digitization. But already, you know, what you can do with your mobile phone, you've got new materials that are going to make, uh, transform, to take over from, I mean, graphene taking over from steel, more powerful than steel, energy from fusion. I mean, um, the e economies and the use of water. I mean, the, again, the economic base in the, in the next 50 years is going to be as transformed as it was in that period 1870 and 1945. Big data as the kind of underpinning of the driverless car and the driverless car is going to be with us in the next decade. I don't think any of the big car manufacturers in the world thought that the challenger to them was going to be Google. Um, and that's just our times. Um, but economic and social consequences are incredible. All those jobs in taxis, already you can see it with Uber. Um, what's going to happen to truck driving, traffic police management, all those low paid jobs in, in parking attendants, garages, uh, in the world of insurance, all going to be transformed actually. Um, just that's, and that's one corner of the economy um, by digitization. I haven't even talked about artificial intelligence, 3D printing, Internet of Things. There is a cascade of formidable change coming towards us, and we all know it, and you're all discussing it. This leads, actually, to one of the interesting aspects. And I think if, one takeaway I'd love you to have um, is this chart, which is to me that uh, in a world in which um, there's so much intellectually driven change, intellectual property rights um, become 
actually one of the most formidable kind of uh, aspects of any business model. On the, on the left there, the investment in intangibles, and the red line is tangibles, factories, uh, hard assets. And actually, in a way, that's actually, um, I think, good news for lawyers because the world of intangibles is, is a much more specific, uh, hard to commoditize, requires legal skills than a world of, of tangibles. And you can see the stock of tangible assets to intangible assets is also kind of rising. The fast-growing firms are ones with um, intangible assets. A bit of work we do at the Big Innovation Center. There's 74% more intangible assets and intellectual property on their balance sheet than non-high-growth firms. So you know, when you're looking at your client base, you want to look at the, and you're wondering where are the prospects over the next 10 years, think ones with intangible assets and intellectual property. This is just some fun, actually. But again, the Department of Business did some brainstorming about where the jobs of the future were. And again, um, you can see that, I mean, some of, the, some of them are far-fetched, but they're probably likely to happen. But all of them have kind of IP, intellectual property, kind of underpinning them. And again, you know, when you, when you look at the kinds of sectors that are, that are likely to kind of be the fast-growing ones, it's exactly the same story. Business services organized around um, kind of unique algorithms, um, design, electronic media, life sciences, uh, even the low-carbon economy, all these areas are um, in intangibly driven. And even caring and servicing for the kind of um, uh, for the newly young old. I mean, by that I mean the 65-year-olds who still leap about on, an, on a tennis court as if they're 40. That's going to become a, a, a really interesting, highly customized business. That then poses the question, how do you manage all this change? Um, and one of, the, one of the things that's become very apparent is the ease of making mistakes. Um, if you talk to anybody in the pharmaceutical industry uh, or the aerospace industry, I mean, you know, what's going to be the material? Um, is graphene going to be the material in which we build planes in 10 years' time? Nobody knows. Um, are we going to create a new generation of antibiotics? Nobody knows. Uh, and actually, if we do, um, who's going to do it? Um, in what labs? In, in what combination? Giving this 32,000 to the power of 31,999 varieties of the human genome. I mean, wow. Unknown unknowns all around. And you can get things wrong phenomenally easily. And what, at Oxford University, um, the Structured Genome Consortium, a great friend of mine runs it, has brought together nine pharmaceutical companies from around the world to actually do genome research because each of them are aware that, if they, that going it alone is just um, uh, self-defeating. I mean, they all read the same peer-reviewed papers. They, don't, they think that's the one where there might be the, the, um, the, 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 the discovery. They all invest hundreds of millions of dollars in it, find it's a blind alley, and they've all wasted hundreds of millions of dollars much cleverer, actually, to kind of act in concert. So there's a lot more risk pooling, joint problem solving, um, and business-to-business and -business collaboration necessarily. And of course, that is very tricky to do. I mean, where do you draw the line between, I mean, how, do you, how, how are you going to divvy up the risk? How are you going to share the gains? Uh, who's going to own what intellectual property is discovered? Um, I think there's going to be um, lots of work for you, ladies and gentlemen, going forward uh, in territories like this. Um, as the companies in which you work have to play around with open innovation strategies in this world of extreme and rapid change. But I'm worried about the structures of um, the capitalism in which this is operating. I'm worried it's regressing um, to the kind of capitalism that um, didn't work um, in, the, in that uh, earlier kind of epoch. We're watching the emergence of the ownerless, depurposed company. I have a little project going at the Big Innovation Centre, which we're doing with the Bank of England, on trying to think through um, how to reintroduce purpose to business life uh, and how important it is to have kind of some kind of moral narrative kind of underpinning um, what a company does and why people get out of bed in the morning and what actually kind of is the social glue that actually internally holds the company together and actually permits it to kind of um, strike good deals with its supply chain and with its customers. Depurposed companies aren't good partners they're not particularly good to deal with over time, and they're certainly not particularly innovative. But the way that, in Britain in particular, our companies are owned with very few block shareholdings, very fragmented shareholder base, it's not the same story in the States for those people who come over from New York, 
nor is it the same story from colleagues who come from the European Union, where the companies are, you know, there's an ability um, with block shareholding and cr critical mass of shareholdings for kind of purpose to be expressed and then on expressed uh, by, 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 by leadership teams. And uh, um, I think that um, uh, British companies, easy to take over and depurposed, have become, uh, in this world in which, it's, in which there's so much uncertainty, have become low investors and low innovators. And uh, that's the reason, I think, why exports have been flat for a decade and imports continue to rise and why the country has a current account deficit of 5% of GDP and which, if it continues, uh, will have a current account deficit in the 2020s of 10% of GDP, which will be unfinanceable and will, will raise big questions about how the country was run. Um, Mrs Thatcher will no longer be considered of having a state funeral, I think, as um, Britain surveys 30 or 40 years of really, really misguided policy and where um, large parts of the country are, um, are either areas of underemployment or no employment and we've got very little to sell the rest of the world. That is a big risk. Only 10% now of the equity of British companies is owned by British pension funds and insurance companies. You talk to the great um, owners of, and we talk to people at Fidelity Asset Management or you know, who's in a US asset management company, um, BlackRock, they'll tell you, you know, actually, you know, we own your equity. Where are you guys gone? You know, where is the owners of, of, of uh, where is the equity that, might, that used to own British companies? Hedge funds have filled the vacuum, of course, but they're extremely short term and they exacerbate this kind of depurposed, kind of highly short term um, capitalism with the knock on effects it has on, 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 on workforces and morale. Are we watching the reinvention in the name of um, you know, the magic of the market, the, the world that actually dis was so dysfunctional between 1870 and 1945? And I think we have, and I don't think you can explain um, Donald Trump uh, or Bernie Sanders uh, or actually Jeremy Corbyn um, or UKIP uh, or the distrust of the foreigner uh, or um, alternative for Deutschland uh, without actually get, getting under the skin of actually um, the way in which contemporary capitalism is operating. It's very careless of the human beings it employs, and there's been a deep loss of trust in business in the States, the loss of trust in business in this most business-friendly countries of all. I mean, there's never been lower levels of trust um, plotted by the Pew Foundation at, than now, um, and the stunning sums of money that are paid um, for not much um, gain, and actually, uh, what, you're, what you're beginning to notice is that Walmart have um, get a lot of criticism. Have actually decided to pay de facto um, what we in the Britain call a living wage uh, to all the people on the grounds that actually um, their, profit, their, their profits as a share of GDP and their, and their profits are so absolutely high. They need to be able to motivate their people. And you're watching a kind of you're watching profound things being opened up. Debates in the states. Um, Hillary Clinton's uh, criticism of um, quarterly capitalism, um, big interest um, by Democrats in, in stakeholder capitalism, which was coined in the state we're in 20 years ago. Huge anxiety from, from Fortune 500 leaders that um, of the loss of trust in business. Mirrored a bit, actually, um, in Britain, kind of see the interest of so many companies in the project that we're doing at the big innovation centre with the Bank of England. The fact that even the Bank of England is prepared to kind of you know, enter the list and talk about these things. And so many major companies are prepared to kind of support this project. It gives you some sense of actually where people are and how concerned they are. Um, you can see here, this is in the UK. Um, business investment has been falling since 2001. That is the um, purple line. Uh, same story in the United States. And of course, it wasn't just a, an, an Anglo-Saxon problem. I mean, although Britain is kind of... Um, top of class of actually the amount of debt as a share of GDP. Um, we were hard, um, hard on our heels, a lot of other, uh, other countries. If Cameron and Osborne were to win um, this um, referendum, I think it would open up a very important debate in the Conservative Party, because Cameron is a self-avowed liberal Tory. He has Harold Macmillan on his study wall. And I think that he is, in, I mean, he is very much um, would like to think about uh, developing a mixed economy for the 21st century. So would the people plotting to take over um, from Jeremy Corbyn. Um, that could open up a very interesting debate, but that's where we have to have an argument. We need a growth model that's less based on private debt 
And we have to think about, we are, as a national community Britain, we have a fantastic number of business startups, but no few scale-ups. And I think that's all about the equity shortfall um, that I described earlier, um, the terms on which um, too much, um, the, the, the lack of thinking about what the innovation, financial, and ownership ecosystem is in which small firms grow to medium-sized firms and on. We must put purpose back into business. We need to create a functioning kind of social model, otherwise the disaffected will just vote against foreigners and keeping our societies open will become harder and harder. Uh, digitization, I mean, the story is um, a phenomenal one. I mean, you saw that the um, central bank governor of Bangladesh had to resign because $100 million was stolen from their account in the New York Fed where they kept their um, deposits. Um, and someone kind of obviously got um, the kind of passwords and uh, hacked in and stole $100 million. I mean, uh, no one goes to China um, with a laptop with any information on it because it will get hacked. Um, China is the kind of hacking kind of capital of the universe. And it's become, I think, um, probably the um, single kind of um, one of the single most important business risks of our time. I know um, at Oxford University, um, we're very concerned. We've got, we're constantly under attack. Um, and it's only as strong as its weakest link. So there are 29 under undergraduate colleges at Oxford, and there's nine graduate colleges, and each has its own IT team. But you can hack into the entire university system through any one college. And so you know, you, we have become very interdependent, and we're always looking at you know, the quality of our passwords, the quality of our kind of kit, that's, um, the quality of the screening. Um, and actually, the truth of the matter is, is that very few kind of people are actually kind of um, have the skills to know actually what good looks like, and you're completely reliant on your kind of IT teams. IP, the big story of our, of our times, as I've mentioned earlier, I mean, I think this is going to be where um, there's going to be a lot of work um, for general counsels. And then I think that if you, if you just stand back and talk about the kind of international framework, I, I've made my point and I won't make it again, but I, you know, it's 99 days we vote on this and, you know, I'm, I, I'm not confident. I was much more confident, um, much more confident six months ago that um, um, the vote would be 60-40 in favour of staying in the European Union. And I'm really not sure now. And I think, I think if it falls out that we do leave the European Union with so many uh, lives and interests and business models um, put, at, put at risk, solely because of the prejudices of um, you know, five newspapers and you know, a faction in the Conservative Party, not even the majority of the Conservative Party, I think that would be a, I, I think big questions will be asked of our democracy, our press, our media, kind of in the kind of chaos that follows. And just, you know, some, 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 some prompts. Um, you're all, you know, the average life expectancy of firms is now around 10 years and falling. So whoever you're working for, if you're under 50, you'll be working for someone else before your career. Um, probably the skill sets you've got are likely to become obsolescent. Please commit to reinventing yourselves constantly. Um, think open innovation um, and get across it because you're gonna be asked by uh, people who work um, with you, for you, report into you about open innovation structures in which they can hopefully mitigate some of the risk that your firms are facing. Um, big implications in this world for HR, of course. This shifting universe, um, hierarchies, um, job definitions, um, how you communicate with the investor community, how you actually um, uh, deal in um, employee voice in a more creative way than we've done hitherto are gonna become profound. These are challenges that are being thrown up by the structures of our capitalism, the challenges and opportunities of our technology, and what we should not be doing is blaming the European Union, blaming public debt, uh, or blaming the nanny state. Um, it's the budget in two hours' time. And I, um, I'm, George Osborne won't blame the EU, thank goodness, but I'm sure he'll blame public debt for many of our ills. I take a, sli a slightly different view. But thank you very much indeed for listening to me, and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you, thank you.